Jesus' name. I invite you to stand with me now for the reading of the word of God together. If you would turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. And let us read the word of God together. For they that are after, let's start together. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. Let's read verse 7 again one more time. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. There was a, remain standing just for a second. There's a long-standing fable that dates back to the 1500s, which said that the story goes like this. One day truth and falsehood went bathing. It could have been in a river or in a lake, but truth and falsehood went bathing together. And then falsehood got out of the water first. And when falsehood dried off and got ready to put on his clothes, instead of putting on his clothes, he picked up truth's clothes and put them on. So when truth, and went on his way, so when truth came up out of the water, dried off and got ready to get dressed, he recognized that the clothes that were left was not his clothes but falsehood's clothes, and that falsehood had taken his clothes, put them on, so when people see falsehood, they would be, it would look like they were seeing truth. But it was truth wrapped, falsehood wrapped in truth's clothes. So truth had a decision to make. Am I going to put on falsehood's clothes? Or what I'm going to do? But truth said, no, there's no way under heaven I'm going to put on falsehood's clothes. So truth made a decision to go forth into town, like they say, butt naked. <laughs> Hence, we got this idiom or this phrase that has commonly been used for hundreds of years, the naked truth. We've been going through a sermon series on being a, becoming a spirit-led Christian. Today is another message in this series. The title of today's message is The Naked Truth truth. Father in heaven, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. We are asking for your spirit to speak without hindrance, without uh, distraction, without measure, oh God. We pray that your convicting power would move upon this place and upon our hearts, oh God. And we pray that, that God would be honored and glorified and Jesus would be magnified, Lord, and there would be a transforming encounter between each person and you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say amen. Please be seated. If any one of you have ever gone fishing or tried to uh, catch any animals, be it fish, be it um, rodents or, or, or anything, usually what we do is we try to make a trap, right? And the way we make traps is um, we usually put some bait to attract the attention of what we're trying to catch. And then there is something that would capture or, 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 or lock in that whatever we're trying to catch. I remember uh, one time I took Carson and Son to um, 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 a fish farm and um, uh, we should have gone to the river to try to fish, but I'm not a big fisher, fisherman, amen? So we rented a pool, we threw it in, and we were, I was, 
you know, you know, reeling it in and getting and just coming up with seaweeds. And so another fellow, he he had a um, he was he came prepared. You know, he had his own rod. He had um, a bucket there, and 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 there was fish in it. And so I, I started watching this guy, and because you know, when I'm not catching nothing, and my kids are there, it's kind of embarrassing. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm supposed to be teaching them how to fish, right? So I looked at this guy, see what he was doing, and when he brought his, he he reeled it in, and there was fish on, uh, you know, dangling on the end of that pole. I, I was like, how did you get this? Because they had given us some. Um, uh, some worms there, and I was trying to put those worms on, and the fish were not responding to that. And, and so he showed me that he had um, like a bobbing um, um, bait. Thanks. You know I don't know nothing about this, right? I, I didn't know what to call the thing, right? And so what happened is um, when the, he, he would throw that out, the fish would be attracted to that. And when they went to, 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 to bite it, what would happen is that they would not only bite the bait, but they would, the hook would lock them in and trap them so they could not get loose. And every person that's trying to catch an animal has to have some device to trap it, to hold it down, to pin it down, to lock it so that it cannot escape. You know, in the same way, the word of God tells us that the enemy does the same thing. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and following, the word of God says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Talking about preachers. Verse 25, op opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses. Sin makes you lose your mind. And escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Notice what it says that the enemy does. He somehow creates a trap to trap us so that he will take us captive to do his will. When you are trapped, you're trying to escape, but you can't. When you're trapped, you're trying to get away you're trying to make a change, but something is locking you down, pinning you down, holding you down. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't know if anybody's ever been trapped in a lifestyle, trapped in habits, trapped in a relationship, trapped in a bad situation. Um, um, we, we've given our lives to Jesus. We've been baptized and even been filled with the Holy Spirit. And we learned last Sabbath um, that, 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 that there are two mindsets that, that, that are at war. Uh, uh, every Christian has got to decide what type of Christian they will be. Whether they will be a spirit-led Christian or a carnal Christian. And we also saw from the word of God that, 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 in, that, that in order, it's, it's a matter of who controls and governs our wills, which is the governing power in the nature of man. And so um, um, there are carnal Christians and there are spirit-led Christians. Now, um, we learn also according to Romans chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, that God tells us to offer our, our, ourselves to God, um, to submit ourselves to God, to obey him and his will, uh, that whoever we obey, that's whose servants we are. We become the slaves of whoever we obey. And so um, um, in order for us 
to live as free and in the liberty of the children and sons and daughters of God, we need to submit our wills to God's will. We need to choose to serve him and not the enemy. We need to resolve and follow through with that resolution to obey God and to do his will and his will alone. Because whatever you obey, whoever you obey, you are giving them literal control over your life, over your destiny, over your family, over your, your mind, over your heart. Whoever we obey, that's who slaves we become. And so the enemy entices us to, to, to choose to obey him and to listen to him rather than God because he knows that when he does that, whatever sought, whatever we Whatever enticed us, whether we, 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 we fell for a temptation because we were lonely and we wanted some company, or we, or, or we fell for a temptation just because we were broke and we needed some money, so we did something we had no business doing in order to get some money. Are you all with me this morning? Uh, it doesn't matter how it came about. If we ended up, if what enticed us to do wrong, if we wanted uh, some attention, and so we got involved with some people that were giving us the attention we thought we had to have, but they gave us a whole lot more than what we bargained for. It, 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 you know, it doesn't matter what the enticement is. If we were discouraged and you wanted something to pick you up and to encourage you, so you put something into your body that you had no business putting in. It does not matter what enticed us. The enemy's goal is to hook us. And when we come, when he got you us trapped, when we are, are trapped, when we hear the word of God and we understand we need to submit our lives to God and submit our wills to God, we may have a desire and we may even want to and try to, but what happened is he will keep us trapped and prevent us from even yielding our wills to God. To keep us pinned down. Have you all ever done wrestling? I remember when I was younger, we do wrestling. We call it wrestling back then. And... Um, you know, when you're wrestling with somebody, the goal is to pin them down so that even if they try to get up, the, the forces pinning them down are greater than the forces exerted to try to get up. And when you can pin them down for a sufficient num period of time, you know, I hate it. You know, when, if I'm the one doing the pinning, I want them to go one, two, three. But if somebody is pinning me down... I want them to go three. You know what I'm saying, right? But the enemy pins us down so that the effort and the energy that we exert to try to make a decision to yield ourselves to God, there's something pinning us down. We may say, I'm going to quit, but there's something pinning us down. We may say, Never again, but there's something, the forces pinning us down and preventing us from making that resolve and that decision and exercising our wills in a way that will honor God and set us free. And the, 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 the issue today is in order for us to, to, to live in the liberty of the sons and daughters of God who have the Holy Ghost in us, the Bible says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We can praise God right now on that point right there Romans chapter 8 verse 1 because 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 when I've, I'm trying to do right or I have a desire to do right and I fall short God said you gave your life to me I don't condemn you I still love you my grace still covers you and I praise God there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus you see God doesn't just throw us away when we mess up he doesn't just throw us away in our struggle when we fall short because we're struggling to give him our will he covers us with his grace and I say praise God God, glory, hallelujah, amen. When I, my name is standing, be, comes before the judgment bar of God, he doesn't see me. He sees Jesus and his blood covers all of my sins. But you see, the question is, um, um, what is it that keeps us trapped? So that even though we want to be spirit-led Christians, we want a spiritual mind. We are plagued with a carnal mind. What is it that holds us down and keeps us from giving our wills to God? Romans. In order to get to this, y'all, we're going to have to 
get into some naked truth. Everybody may not want to hear this message. You cannot hear this message and be the same. Either the devil is going to take a hold of your life like never before, or God's going to set you free. So if anybody gets up and leaves right now, I would not be offended. I'm telling you, but if you stay, get ready to go deeper. What is it that keeps us trapped, pinned, locked, hooked, addicted, so that I can't yield to God? I'm struggling to trust him. What is it? Romans chapter 8. Uh, let's go to verse 5 to 7 one more time. It says, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Notice, it's all about what we set our minds on, what kind of mind we have, whether a carnal mind or a spiritual mind. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. God does forgive us, but if we remain in carnality, if we remain with a carnal mind, the Bible says it is death. It is leading us straight to death. We can't toy with the mercy of God. We should not allow God's mercy to lead us to presumption. He says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Is there anybody that wants carnal uh, life and peace today? Is there anybody that is serious about pursuing life and peace? We got to be spiritually minded to get that. Verse 7 says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither can it be. It's not that they don't know God's law. A carnal Christian will never be subject to God's law. Will never submit to God's law or his authority. In the church, yes. Involved, yes. Doing ministry, yes. But not subject to God. Even God can't tell him nothing. Because they're not subject to his authority. Carnal Christians have a carnal mind. And they will not be subject to God with a carnal mind. It's impossible for them to submit to God with a carnal mind. That's why rebellion exists even among Christians. The Bible says rebellion is as the sin of of witchcraft which means you're better off you're in cahoots collusion with demonic forces they are the ones that are guiding your life and so to not be subject to God's law means that we refuse we will not submit to his authority and rebellion is the sin against God's authority. It's called the high-handed sin. You see, other sins are sin against God's holiness. Rebellion is a sin against God's authority. It's the worst sin in the world. It's the root of all sins. Not subject to God's law. Because they have a carnal mind. What keeps us trapped in a carnal mind? This verse breaks it down. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Carnal Christians wear a cloak of devotion and put on the clothes of faithfulness. But underneath The veneer of love to God. Underneath the the mascara of readiness for the second coming of Jesus. 
underneath the, 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 the fake eyelashes of happy Sabbath is, the Bible says, enmity toward God. That word, enmity, simply means hostility. It means hatred. God is saying carnal Christians at the core of their being literally hate God. That's why they will not and cannot be subject to God's law. Cannot be subject to God's law. Servant of the Lord says that rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. And she says, rebellion is almost incurable. Almost. This is serious stuff, y'all. And behind it is hatred toward God. When I read this, it, 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 it I'm going to be honest with y'all, it knocked me off my feet. I could not continue reading beyond this verse. Because I realize if, if, if God did not examine my heart and, 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 and determine how much I hated him, I would be the perfect hypocrite. Ultimately resulting in death. Because at the core of a carnal mind is hatred toward God. You see, the reason that in Corinth there was division and confusion with other people is because the, the, the carnal Christians literally hated God. Uh, 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 you know, the, the, the reason some of them hated themselves and they were so insecure that they were always trying to impress and outdo and get attention and praise from other people is because at the core of their being, they hated God. The reason that try, some tried to align themselves with the preacher that seemed to be most popular and, and just say, well, I'm following him, I'm following him, trying to prop themselves up because they hated themselves. But behind that and underneath that is that they literally hated God. And that is the problem that's at the root and the core of carnal Christians. I'm going to cut right to the chase because we're getting out of here soon. It's easy to say, well, you know, I'm not that way. I love the Lord. You know, why would I come to church and take time out of my weekend when I could be shopping if I didn't love Jesus? Why would I give up sports to keep the Sabbath if I didn't love Jesus, why would I take my income that I could be used, that I could use to, 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 to buy other things and to secure my uh, better financial future and invest for, for my own uh, uh, retirement, it, you know, 10%, 15%, 20% of my income? Why would I do all that if I did not love Jesus? But you see, God has had a problem with his people historically. Uh, this is in the Old Testament and certainly in the New Testament. Jesus um, 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 demonstrated this when in, in Mark chapter 7, verse 6. Follow me now. Mark chapter 7, verse 6. He said, quoting Isaiah, he says, he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. It is written, these people honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. They know how to worship. They know how to shout. They know how to say amen. They know how to do the religious things. They know how to pray long prayers. And they know how to present the, the, the cloak of truth. But underneath all that is deep-rooted, deep-seated hatred. And I'm thinking, Lord, how can that be? Are you trying to tell me that I don't love you? Are you trying to tell me that we didn't love you and we don't really love you and all that we're doing is simply going through the motions? Are you trying to say, God, that, 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 that all that we do is simply a form of godliness, but we lack the power of God? 
God, do I really love you or do I really hate you? How could it be that I could hate you? You see, he didn't say, this, you know, hate is strong. It goes deep. God revealed to me this. Most Christians in the church are carnal. And at the root of it is hate toward God. And as I try, I wrestled to wrap my mind around this. God said to me, most Christians tr live in their relationship with me like abused women live with their abuser. The church, carnal Christians, have an abused woman mindset. First of all, some of them have gotten into a relationship with me because they were running from a bad situation. Some of the women that are abused, they, 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 they get involved with somebody that they got involved with because they were running from a bad situation. Could be they were teenagers and there was a bad situation at home or there was a bad relationship and they needed somebody to protect them from. So they run into this relationship with somebody that said the right words and convinced them that they loved them. And so um, um, that's how some people, why some people come to me. They come to me to bail them out of trouble. And that's at the root of their problem. They only want me to, to bail them out of trouble. And so it, it, makes the, it gives them the illusion that they love me, but they don't really care about me. They care about themselves. First problem. Second thing, some people, uh, uh, they, they, get, they, they, they are in relationships and abusive relationships, and they stay in them because they get involved in them because they got involved based on their vulnerabilities, not based on their strengths. So they got into it in a toxic way from get-go. They have no good foundation because they, 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 they have low self-esteem. They're vulnerable because of this trauma and that experience that have happened in their life. And so they, they fall for somebody that gives them some attention or who seems to take an interest in them. And so there's a complexity to this relationship because it was built upon insecurities. And that's why it's so dangerous for people to get involved in relationship with someone um, 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 just because they got a problem and, 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 and you, this person seems like they can help you, you're attracted to them because they can seem to be able to help you with your problem or your struggle. But I just want to say today, according to the word of God, that that's an abuse complex. It's an abusive mindset. And that's the same mindset that carnal Christians have. Oh yes, they came to Jesus. Oh yes, they got baptized. Oh yes, but they were running from a bad situation. Finally, sin caught up with them and they wanted out. And so they saw Jesus as their way out. But they were focusing on the outness, not being in him. They really were not worried about being connected to him. But there are several other things, but I'm going to cut right to the chase right now because we're going to get out of here in a few minutes. Let me just say this, the ultimate issue that keeps an abused woman in, a, in, in, in an abusive relationship, even though he is abusing her every day by his words and by his actions, the, what keeps her trapped is the fear that if she gets up and walks away, he's going to kill her. And most Christians, feel, in fact, they say 90%, 70% of abused women when they leave, 70% of the women that are, are killed from abusive relationships is because it happens after they left. Not while they were still together. Because the abuser was so upset because they felt they lost control. If I can't have you, nobody's going to have you. And if you're in an abusive relationship, let God minister to your heart, but keep looking straight ahead like everything's fine. This is serious stuff, y'all. Uh, carnal Christians love Jesus. Like an abusive woman, they, 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 they want to please their lover. They, they, they try to serve and do good too. Carnal Christians do the same thing with God. We try to serve him, do good things for him. We, we, we want his favor. We're glad that he loves us and died to save us. But we hate him at the core of our being. We hate him. And we're mad. And we, we, we stay in the relationship because we are afraid if we leave it, he's going to kill us. That we're going to go to hell. 
And so the fear of hell is what keeps us in a relationship that we hate. So we come to church because we don't want to go to hell. We keep the Sabbath because we don't want to go to hell. We give, we serve because we don't want to go to hell. So we stay with Jesus and we fake it and pretend that we love him when our hearts are far from him and we hate him. So we are carnal Christians. Because if we leave him, he's going to kill us. Trapped. Stuck. The spirit comes to offer us life and peace. But we're trapped. That fear is a hook that keeps us trapped, pinned, locked. I just come today because I want to say God has set me free from that. I heard one amen from my wife. I'm going to give amen myself. God had to confront me with my own carnal mindset, an abused woman mindset. And I praise God that, that, that Jesus came to set the captives free. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 and, and, and through 4 talks about the freedom that the Holy Ghost gives us, that he came to set us free from the law of sin and death so that we would, would not be trapped and remain trapped in that fear and that bondage from the fear of death. I praise God. God is in the business of setting people free. Somebody saying, oh, you know what? I really love the Lord. Really? Okay, let's break it down all the way. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. Notice what God says. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates his brother, is a... Come on now. Read this with me. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates his brother, is a liar... We're talking about all the stuff we saw in Corinth, the hate being manifested, which sometimes is manifested in the church. God says, you think you love God, you're lying. All your religiosity, if you hate your brother, you're a liar. Save your profession, save your words. I'm not impressed. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot. Cannot love God whom they have not seen. Amen. Hate God. Evidenced by hating your brother or your sister. It simply means you hate God. Bible says Luke chapter 16 verse 13. No man can serve two masters. Either. He says you cannot. He didn't say you will not. You cannot. Either you will hate the one and love the other. Watch this, y'all. He didn't say you will love the one and tolerate the other. I, who, you will hate one and love the other. Or you will be devoted to one and despise, with another word for deep resentment and hatred, the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So if we love money, that means we hate God. Not just that we're not, we know we're not tight with God. No, no, we hate him. No matter how we pray, we hate him. No matter how many songs we sing, we hate him. No matter how many professions we make, how, how many meetings we attend, how many sermons we, we hear, it doesn't, he says, if you love the world, you hate me. If I'm not first in your affections, you hate me. The reason we struggle with giving God our will is because we hate him. Let's just break this down. You see, how can I yield my all to God? I, I just want to say, in order for us to get out of this, the first thing we need to do is face it. Touch somebody and tell them, face it. 
It's time. If we want deliverance, we got to face the hatred in our own hearts. If we, if we really want God to, 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 to lead us into a life under the power of the Holy Spirit, if we want to shake off this carnal mindset and this abused woman's mindset and embrace a mind that's led and empowered by the Spirit of God, we've got to face our hatred. Face it. Face it. Face it. The second thing we need to do is to fess it. Tell somebody say fess it. Somebody say what's that? Say well that's Ebonics for confess. Fess it. We need to be real with God. There's got to come a time in our lives when we not only face the naked truth in our hearts but we need to articulate with our mouths that which exists in our hearts. We need to fess up. We need to confess. And I want to say that our way of doing church and our western sterilized approach to Christianity where we are so focused on being spiritually politically correct in our communication and interactions with God keeps us trapped in carnality and a carnal mindset because it prevents us from fessing up the hatred that exists in our hearts. But if you want to be delivered, you got to do what God's word said. Did he not say in John 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, is hatred to God a sin? Is it a sin? Did he not say if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness? You see, our efforts to be respectful and reverent and all that stuff is all part of a facade that keeps us trapped. Oh, you see, I was not brought up in a home where I could look at my mother or father and say, I hate you. I don't know if any of y'all did. But those words would have never come out of my mouth or any of my sisters because in our home, we were taught respect. You could not talk back. You couldn't just raise your voice and slam doors and, and throw furniture. <laughs> and even if you lost your mind, even crazy people know what line not to cross. I'm serious. I've seen some crazy folks, but monkey, there's a saying where I grew up, monkey know what tree to climb. Crazy folk. They're not too crazy to get their lights knocked out. So, because we know we need to respect God, everything we tell him needs to be something that sounds good. Lord, I praise you. You are awesome. You are wonderful. You are holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Lord, we reverence your name. We honor your name. We bow down, but we're lying. Because he says, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. In vain you worship me. It's in vain. It's in vain. You're lying. You hate me. And the thing is that God already knows. So why are we covering up? He already knows. He says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we want to break from a carnal mindset, we've got to face what keeps us in carnal mindset. The Bible says a carnal mind is enmity, is hatred toward God. Until that is dealt with, you will never be led by the Spirit of God. And so we need to face it and fess up that we've got a carnal mindset. You see, there's need, we need to come a time in our lives when as we get on our knees, or as we're standing in frustration, we look up to the God and says, God, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. 
Because you gave me parents that were crackheads. I hate you. Because my father was never in my life. I hate you. Because you didn't keep my marriage together. I hate you. Because you took my child's life. I hate you. Because the people that were supposed to protect me as a child did not protect me. I was violated as a child. I hate you. Because you made me with an appearance that, and you put me into a race that is despised and rejected, mistreated. In the United States of America, I hate you that we're mistreated from the cradle to the grave. I hate you, God. Because I had to struggle to make ends meet all my life. I hate you. Because you, I thought you would have protected me from all the traumatic things that happened in my life. I hate you that you allowed people to look down on me and to mistreat you. I hate you that the people that were supposed to carry me and nurture me and protect me, they dropped me. And then they stomped at me and they told me how worthless I was. I hate you. I hate you. It's only when we face it and when we fess it that there can be a change. We want to be delivered. You want to have a spirit filled life. Or it's time to shake off the carnal mindset and the hatred is what keeps us trapped until we can face it and release it. We will always be carnally minded. We will always be hellions in the church. We will never be peaceful, never be happy, never be satisfied. We will, and, and at the end of that, we're going to still lose our souls. But if we can be honest with God and tell him our frustrations, I hate you, Lord, that I poured into my child. And this child has turned around and stabbed me in the back and had nothing to do with me. Lord, I hate you. When we do that, we're opening our hearts to God. We, 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 are, we are saying, God, it's, uh, it's because I, I hate you, God, because uh, this person told me they loved me and we hooked up together. But when I came up pregnant, they got ghost. And the only thing they wanted me to do was get rid of that child. And I hate you. Because they weren't there and I hate you. Because you didn't stop me from taking their advice. I can't, but you're going to guilt me now. Every day after. I hate you, God. How can I surrender my life to you? When you've let me down time and time and time again. When we have the courage to face, to fess, we got to do one more thing. We got to forsake. We've got to choose to forsake that hatred, that resentment. And give God permission to take the hatred away. How does he do that? We need to invite him into the deepest recesses of our being where there is the greatest pain, where there is the greatest sense of loss and disappointment and brokenness. I've just come today to tell you, when we have the courage to forsake clinging to our pain and our anger and our disappointment and, and believing that we cannot trust God because he didn't prevent us from the 
painful things that were inflicted upon our lives. And he didn't stop us from the things we did that brought pain to ourselves. When we can turn to God and say, I'm hurting, I need you to help me. If you don't help me, nobody will. If you don't give me healing, I'll never turn to you. God, I need you to minister to my pain. When we have the courage, the Bible says, if you confess our sins and forsake, we will have mercy. Well, I'm willing to turn away from clinging to this hate because I feel that that's my way of protecting myself. I've got to watch out for myself because you didn't watch out for me. When we can turn from that and say, God, I'm going to focus on you. I need you. I'm going to seek you in spite of my disappointment, in spite of how you didn't come through. Lord, I'm expressing how I felt, but I need you, oh God. What happens is that when he comes in through the power of the Holy Ghost, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is the comforter. He knows how to meet a person at the point of their pain, and he can minister. He is the greatest surgeon. We go to doctors to, to help us to, to perform a surgery on our hearts and our bodies to stop the pain. If God can give doctors wisdom to do that, what makes us think that he can't stop the pain to a wounded soul? Jesus said, I, the Spirit of God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He, he says, I came to heal the brokenhearted. That's the reason why I came. I didn't just come for to die so you can go to heaven. I came to heal your broken hearts. And when we seek him, we get he, you won't be healed unless you go to the doctor and allows the doctor to focus and do whatever he or she needs to do to what's causing your pain. Or oh, we got to give God access to our traumas. We got to give him access to our disappointments. We got to let him minister to the deep places where we hurt and we've been injured and mistreated. We need to let God minister to our pain for there is a bomb in Gilead to heal the wounded soul. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the sinner whole. I praise God, church, when we turn to him, when we turn to him in all honesty in the nakedness of our pain and we can say, God, I hate you. God, I've been hurting, but I need you to help me and to to deal with my pain, oh God. We're going to learn that there's a power in the word of God. That God is faithful. That God is greater than our disappointments. We're going to learn that Jesus Christ is truly a healer. And he is able to heal the broken heart. See, Romans, you see, Jesus himself came to this world. He suffered and bled and died. He did not just die. He suffered first. He suffered first. He chose to subject himself to everything that brings us pain. He chose to subject himself to abuse. He subjected himself to hatred. He subjected himself to rejection. He subjected himself to be born into a poor family. He subjected himself to, to, to not have a father he could call his own. He subjected himself to mistreatment. He was stripped naked it on the cross. It's not the sanitized pictures that the artists show us about Jesus on the cross. He was physically violated. He was, he was sexually violated. He was stripped naked on the cross and Jesus subjected himself to all that suffering and all that mistreatment and because, and, and when he was on the cross and they were saying uh, they, they mocked him and they derided him. They lied on him. They mistreated and misrepresented him and humiliated him and Jesus Jesus was on the cross and it was hurting. It's not the, the nails that hurt him. It was the, the, the mental anguish, the emotional breakdown, the spiritual pain at the depths of his being that caused Jesus to suffer and bleed and die. In fact, as he was hanging on the cross, he said, God, Father, he says, Father, uh, he, he, he said, Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why aren't you here for me right now? As the sun refused to shine and the darkness engulfed the earth, Jesus cried out. He opened his mouth and he said, he said, God, you're not here. Why you're not here? I can't stand you because you pulled away from me. I can't stand you because you, you're not here. Why aren't you here? And then he made a decision. Into your hands, I'm committing my spirit. 
It feels like you're not here. But I'm going to go based on your word. You said if I die on the third day, you will raise me up. I'm going to trust you as much as I'm hurting right now. I'm going to commend myself to you. I'm going to give you everything, including my pain. Because I'm depending on you to fulfill your word, to raise me up. And then he bowed his head and he died. I just praise God that his word is true, y'all. Whenever anybody commits even the worst part of themselves to God, God will work in them. God raised him up early Sunday morning. Amen. All power was in his hands. He wasn't bleeding anymore. He wasn't hurting anymore. God renewed him. He had a new mind. He had a new body. God renewed him. We serve a God that is in the business of restoration. He is in the business of making things new. I don't care what's happening in your marriage. Oh, we got to tell God about our frustrations. We, he is able to make things new. It doesn't matter what is happening with our children. It doesn't matter the pain in our hearts. He can handle it. Jesus made a decision to serve God, to surrender to his will, to align his will with the Father's will, and that's why he hung his head and he died, and God honored him. I just come here to tell you today, if you are struggling, because God has exposed hatred in your heart. Come on, you got to face it and fess it and, and, and forsake it. And by forsaking, you're choosing to say, God, I'm choosing to love you. I'm choosing to open up myself to you. I'm not going to withhold anything from you. No secrets in my heart. Nothing in my life. I'm going to tell you everything that you allow me to see in me because I need you to fix it. I need you to deal with, with it. I need you to heal me because I can't heal myself. And we're going to discover there's power in the word of God. There's power in the word of God. The Bible says that there's suffering before glory. Romans chapter 8 verse 18. He says, he says in Romans 8 20, take all things work together for good. In the midst of what you've been going through, all you can see is your pain. All you can see is your tears. All you can see is your loved ones that you, that God laid to rest and you wanted them to be here. But God says in everything you're going through, I'm working it out. I'm moving it out for your good. You can't, it doesn't look good right now. But the time will come when you will give me praise because I kept you through it. I carried you through it. And I blessed you in spite of it. I just want to give God praise today. And he tells us in Romans chapter 8, he says, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. He says, in all these things, you are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And see, God is working in the midst of our most painful situations and the stuff in our hearts because he's working within us to make us more than conquerors. You can't be a conqueror unless you got a fight. You can't be a winner unless you've got a contest. You can't be an overcomer unless you've got an issue or problem or struggle to overcome. So God is allowing these things. He's allowed these things to show us that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. He's allowed the painful tragedies and the disappointing experiences so we can connect ourselves with him so that we will be able to testify before angels and on fallen worlds about the power of the grace of God. We will be able to testify that his grace is able to heal. His grace is able to restore that he deserved to be loved and trusted because he is faithful and his love is stronger than every Every destructive and evil force that has impacted our lives, his love is greater, y'all. Yes. When we release our pain, we'll be free to love with all of our hearts. Today, God has brought all of us here. Because he wants us to have a spiritual mind. But he wants us to confront our hatred toward him. Express it. Release it. So we'll be free to surrender our all to him. You've heard this word today. As God has moved on your heart. 
It's your choice. If you're going to give him access to your whole heart. We usually keep the pain away from people and God. Because if anybody touches it, it's going to hurt. He never said it won't hurt. But it's not going to hurt always. The time will come when we let God touch our hurt. He's not going to take away our memories. But when it's brought up, the pain will be gone. And so today, if you want to seek God, Face your hatred, face it, and forsake it so you can choose to give him all of your heart. As the praise team sings this song, I invite you to come on down right now. And then we'll seek God together. of you my cloudy days are all I can sing to you this song I just want to say that I 